Good evening and welcome to 15 Minutes with Longevity. My name is Giselle Wertheim Ames and I'm your host for this evening. Tonight we're going to be speaking to Dr. Antonio Rodriguez. He's a reproductive medicine specialist and director of the MedFem Fertility Clinic, as well as Dr. Evelyn Mashoka, chief specialist and head of the Department of Urology at Steve Biko Academic Hospital. And we're going to be talking about infertility within South Africa, what could be causing this issue among so many men and women. So, thank you very much. Great to have you in the studio this evening. Dr. Rodriguez, I'm going to start with you and just talk about, uh, should we be concerned about the, what looks to be rising levels of infertility in the population? And I understand in other countries it's between about 10 and 15 percent. Do we fall within that range? Are we seeing some worrying trends? Worldwide it's definitely increased and South Africa is, is definitely part of that. Two diverse groups, obviously. The one is, is, is uh, tubal disease, which has been there a long time. And then we're getting really the lifestyle situations, which is increasing at twofold. One, because people are having babies much later. And number two, because those lifestyle problems have, have managed to actually become a problem by the time you're 35, 36, 40. In the past, if you had your baby at 20, there was no time for those lifestyles to impact on fertility. And that's obviously driven by economic issues. People, women, more women in the workplace, people Absolutely. working harder, longer. Um, I, I was also interested that maybe there could have been underreporting in the past. Could that have been because infertility does have connotations to it? So it's a very private issue. And perhaps before, you know, a decade or so ago, people were not reporting it as much or talking about it as openly. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know from your point of view, Evelyn, but I mm. think, I think it's, it's increased rather than underreporting. Yes, I think the other thing that is important is our males being able to accept that you can have a male factor in infertility. In the past, it was mainly women who would first go to see the doctor to be checked that there's a problem because when a woman is infertile, it's visible. They don't fall pregnant. But males at present, they are aware that it can be a male factor. So the awareness is actually making it easy for the consultation to be earlier and to seek intervention. And that's pretty much, that's a heartening thought actually, mm. because again, this dynamic of whose responsibility in the couple is it, you know, often falls on the shoulders of, of the woman and, mm. and, and seen that she's not a great, you know, carrier of babies. Yes. Um, just with regard to that, I mean, why would a, per, a, a, a woman or a couple be infertile? What would be the indications, Dr. Mishoka? Uh, for a couple to be infertile, we like looking at it can be a male factor that is there. It can and, be a and female what would that factor. Be? What would the male factor uh, be? Let me just mention on the male factor, skin, it can be things that the person is born with, like genetic issues, for instance, things like Klinefelter syndrome. It can be issues that affect the testes themselves, or it can be issues that affect the transportation of the sperms. When looking at testicular issues, I want actually the viewer to also be aware of things like trauma, things like undescended testes, which can be intervened earlier, which something can be done for. Uh, and at present, the other things we look at is things like testicular tumors, because that affect young men. And of course, the treatment that the person can be exposed to, like chemotherapy, irradiation. So fertility is a very important uh, aspect in the male. And on trauma as well, the important thing that I think we should look at is like patients who have got spinal cord injuries, because these are usually young men. Mm -hmm. We are living in a country where violent crime is quite high. So we like actually letting the people know that even if you could be having a spinal cord injury, ask your doctor if you can have cryopreservation of sperms, because later you may want to have kids. Those are the male factors that I will quickly uh, just mention on. You can actually and, mention yes, the other. Mm -hmm. I think the public sector <coughs> experience is probably going to differ. Uh, I mean, that would be my natural assumption. There would be similarities, but obviously mm -hmm. what you're speaking about are, are very endemic pro problems in communities, in the broad-based communities. Of course, you in the private sector area would probably deal with, uh, are you seeing a different, yeah, I different think issues arising? I think the two things, Evelyn's message earlier, we will not look after a couple unless the male's tested. That's mm. it. Yes. We're not prepared that to do that. Yes, yeah, it is. That you've got to bring the male into it. In our kind of practice, 50% of our patients have a dual problem. It's not at the, at the extensive level that Evelyn's talking about, but we're talking about poor morphology, lower sperm counts, uh, problems with DNA in the sperm. That's all to do with environmental issues, with lifestyle, with, with, how, uh, with uh, diets in men. We don't exclude men. Men have mm. to do the same as the women, smoking, alcohol, um, abuse of drugs 
um, testosterone, gym mm -hmm. products, terrible. Those things are terrible. Oh, that's very interesting. So those have a negative impact Absolutely. on... Absolutely. One dose of steroids that you take from uh, in a gym or given to you to make you feel better will actually make the sperm count zero. Sure. And on the, and on the woman's side, what mm. are typically the kind of reasons for infertility in women? Now you get the twofold. The one is the tubal disease problem, which is mostly sexually transmitted diseases. The way that's diagnosed is usually by an x-ray of the pelvis where they put dye through the tubes to see if they open. And that's still worldwide the biggest cause of mm. infertility. 60% of, of infertility is tubal disease. We in a private practice in where we at don't see as much as the hospital practices and therefore the hospital practices often have a problem because what do you do with the patients mm. with tubal disease? And I think that's an interesting point because and that's an awareness issue as well. You know, that people understand that sexually transmitted diseases may have that impact on, on their ability to actually have children later in life if not treated correctly. Yes, I mean, um, if, uh, like I just said to you, in males, the transportation of the sperm is yes. important. So with uh, sexually transmitted infections, they can affect the vas deferens, which is the one that, you know, transports the sperm from the testes all the way out. They can have urethral stricture disease. They can have prostatitis. So all of that can actually have an impact, not only on closing the tubes, but even on the viscosity or the thickness mm -hmm. of, the, of the sperm because that affects the movement or what you call motility of the sperms. Now I'm very interested <coughs> in you spoke about the lifestyle factors and yes. we know lifestyle factors have a huge impact on general health issues. When it comes to fertility, are we seeing the same impacts, sure. similar impacts? Sure. Well in our women patients, the ones that don't have tubal disease or, or un they may still have tubal disease, but polycystic ovarian syndrome is very high. This is a, a problem with ovulation. It's a problem where the, 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 the ovaries just can't get to release an egg. What is the cause of that? Excess of insulin, whether you're thin, whether you're overweight, whether you're normal weighted. So it's primarily a dietary problem. We treat it by treating insulin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, back to the lifestyle. If you're not eating properly, if you're overdoing the carbs, which in a modern society, no matter what group you're in, whether you're low socioeconomic or you go right up to the top, people do too much, too many carbs. They eat too much carbohydrates, and then in your in, in your endometriosis, where there are big, big uh, huge problem in females. Ninety percent of the women we see have endometriosis, and, and, that, and that arises. From well, it's cells that grow in the abdomen, yes. around the ovaries, behind the tubes, and those cells are exactly the same cells as the lining of the uterus. Is that maybe masked by a very early use of the pill? I've, I've read some documents. Uh, yeah, I think the pill to helps to control it. Okay. No, it doesn't mask it. This is a disease where women's immune systems are allowing cells to grow in the, in the abdomen. We, over the last 15 years, on our research and the kind of work we do, believe that stress plays a huge role in reducing immune systems. And because your immune system is not functioning, the cells grow in the abdomen. So we try and do that lifestyle management before you do anything. Mm. Get your diet right, get your stress right, stop smoking, male and female, critical. Okay, so let's say we do that and it's not working. What happens in the public sector ar around that? So we've tried to deal with these things, dealing with that um, approach. What's the next step? Uh, what I should say is most of the time when we see couples, they are past that step because mm. we have a couple that is already trying to have a child. The issue is who are the people that we will intervene. Yes. It can't be a couple that has been trying to have a child two months ago. So what we usually prefer to inform people is that if you've been trying, that is an average age, that is where the female partner is less than 35 years of age. If you've been trying for more than a, a year, a year or so, then that is the time when we have to check the semen analysis and of course, you know, female checkup that will be done by a gynecologist. But in the older age group that is above the age of 35, you don't want to wait for the whole year because you are looking at the fertility, especially in the female partner. So every couple is looked at upon individually because the, the, the stress is not the same. Mm. And what is also important is not to look at the couple in isolation, but looking at their social trends as well because these are people who are going through different pressures. For instance, we do have many males who end up not wanting to come for a second semen analysis. Remember, uh, infertility in a man is the second highest stressor after the loss of a spouse. 
So we have to look at that sure. as well. That, that, that's yes. quite a, a definitive stat. Mm. Mm. Now, understanding in private health care, there wouldn't be a limitation on age. If I'm 55 and I decide I want to have my fifth child mm. and I want to pay for it, I can come to you and, and you're going to obviously within reason help me. Is that the same for the, uh, the public sector? I understand that there are different ca uh, categorizations there and of who gets help and who doesn't. Yeah, let me just give you an idea with the current uh, fertility clinics we have in the country. I think it's about three or four in the whole country. So for how many people? So if, if you don't have a cut 49 off million or so, well probably only 40 or 50 percent of those would be in the in the public. Yes, so now yeah. the issue is you want to offer treatment that will actually give you the most uh, outcome. And that is why the female uh, age becomes important. The current age that we use is about 38 years for the female partner because you know that the likelihood of uh, having good outcome there is relatively high. That is the patient doesn't have to go through many cycles. So it is a determining factor on you know, demand versus supply. Okay. Mm. Obviously a different story uh, yes. with regard to yes. a private healthcare environment. What, what, how do you approach? You know, we will treat anyone. Obviously, people over the age of 50, there's strict criteria of who we will allow to be pregnant. They really do need to be fit psychologically, um, physically, and from an obstetric point of view. There's not a lot of in that group, and using donor eggs in that group. And remember that in our, we, we have a very big donor egg program going in our clinic probably um, 25. Can we talk about the donor egg? I mean, yes. it's, it's a concept that probably a lot of people find very difficult to consider when mm. they are young and they're healthy and the, the world is their oyster and the last thing they're thinking about is not being able to have a baby. I mean, when you're in your 20s, certainly you don't think sure, about that. Sure. So in our group of women over 35, and, and obviously a lot of the, some of them below 35, that, that grows very quickly. And uh, at the end, donor eggs are available to that group of patients and it offers them a child. Their husband's sperm, they carry and nurture that baby and at the end of the day it, it offers them a child. Sure. Just very quickly I wanted to ask you last last word for what advice would you give to a couple who are experiencing problems? Uh, I would like to say to the couple that you are not the only one. There are people who are going through that if you have to go through the treatment go early. Don't wait too long. You know people wait for over 10 years to go and seek help. Go early, go as a couple, because it will make you more than break you if you are looking at it as a couple. The other important thing is that to have actual, think outside the box. Have an open mind, for instance, for donor egg, also donor sperms. That is the other thing that you should have earlier when you are starting to look for medical intervention. And psychological support, I hope. Yes, of course. Good. And of Couples course, the lifestyle. Counseling. Lifestyle, it's, a, it's, it's important for the young person who's watching this, who has not even you know, started thinking of having a baby. Look at your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Take care of yourself, and the rest will actually go fine. Great. Great. Thank you very much for joining us in Thank the studio. You. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you'll tune in next week again, where we'll be looking at allergies, how they affect us during the change of seasons and what we can do about it. Stay well, be healthy, and I look forward to seeing you again next week for your dose of health news. Good night.